This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. What is going on, my fellow Norse nerds? My name is John Solo, and every good hero needs a noble steed. The Lone Ranger had silver, Bellerophon had Pegasus, Gandalf had Shadowfax. <coughs> Oh, and we can't forget Donkey, of course. All right, I hope you heard that. She called me a noble steed. Well, as noble and impressive as these horses are, there is one that stands out as the best of the best. His name is Sleipnir, and his master is none other than the king of the Aesir, the Allfather himself, Odin. If you've seen any episode of this show before, chances are you've heard the name Sleipnir at least once because he appears in several prominent Norse myths. Granted, he doesn't always have a huge role because he is indeed a horse, but make no mistake, he is incredibly valuable to the Aesir, and you might be surprised to hear that they have Loki to thank for his existence. You'll see what I mean by that soon enough, but first, if you're a fan of mythology and want more content about the Greek, Norse, and one day Egyptian gods sent to your sub box every week, trample over those like and subscribe buttons with a horse. And now I present to you the messed up mythology of Slepnir. Just like every other episode of Norse Mythology Explained, you can find all the information we're covering today in two books. The first is called the Prose Edda, and it was written by an Icelandic poet named Snorri Sturluson around 1200 AD. Snorri's writings were heavily influenced by Christianity, but to this day, the Prose Edda is the most informative resource we have about Norse mythology. Its only competitor is our other source for today, the Poetic Edda, a collection of works crafted by Norse poets who will remain forever nameless because they didn't bother to write anything down themselves. There's a chapter in the Prose Edda called the Gilfaginning, and in this chapter we learn a ton about Norse beliefs. Everything from the creation of our world to the destruction of it is covered, and between those two points we're told about Sleipnir. Sleipnir is the steed of Odin. He's gray, has eight legs, and he's the best of all horses. What does that mean? Just think of all the things horses are good at. Running, jumping, quadratic functions, Sleipnir is the best at all of them. Every day the Aesir ride their horses across the Bifrost, the burning rainbow bridge that connects Asgard to Midgard. And every day, Odin leads their charge while riding on the back of Sleipnir. Another journey that Sleipnir takes surprisingly often is to the Norse equivalent of the underworld, Hel, or Helheim, as some people like to call it, even though that's not technically correct. The journey is no easy task and entails riding through complete darkness for nine days and nine nights. Yet still, Sleipnir has never flinched when called upon for duty. Whether it was Odin looking to meet with a seer and get answers about his son Baldur's nightmares, or Ermod who rode Sleipnir straight to Hel's palace to ask the queen herself if Baldur could return to Asgard. That being said, Sleipnir wasn't only used for serious matters. That'd be like owning a Ferrari and only using it in car chases. Sleipnir was a specimen and Odin found great joy in showing him off to beings in other realms. Only one time, this led to Thor getting in a pretty epic fight. See, Odin and Sleipnir were trotting their way through Jotunheim, not giving a good god about who saw them, when a giant named Hrunnir called up from below that the Allfather had a magnificent horse. By the way, I say from below because Sleipnir had the power to ride through the air and over the water like it was a hard surface, so he and Odin were essentially flying in midair when Hrunnir called out to them. Only Odin, who just can't take a compliment with class, has to respond by saying, yeah, he is a nice horse, and he's probably a lot faster than anything you've got over here in Buttholeheim. Naturally, Hrunnir was not going to take this disrespect, so he summoned his noble steed, Goldfax, whose name I believe inspired the name of Gandalf's horse, Shadowfax. Fortunately, and unsurprisingly, Odin is able to outrun Hrunnir and Goldfax thanks to his trusty Mount Sleipnir, but the giant does eventually reach Asgard, where he comes face to face with the God of Thunder himself and is ultimately killed. If you want to hear the rest of that story, check out my episode on the messed up origins of Thor after this episode. In the meantime, brace yourself for the very messed up myth of Sleipnir's birth. This story takes place in the early days of the universe. The gods had just completed the construction of Midgard and Valhalla, and it was time for them to focus on their own dwelling. Not long after they had begun their new project, a mysterious man entered their domain to make them an offer. He would build the Aesir the biggest, mightiest fortress possible, a fortress that would protect them from all threats, like giants and trolls, and he would build it in less than three and a half years. It sounds like a hell of an offer, but his payment is steep. He demands to be given the sun, the moon, and the beautiful Freya, the Vanir goddess associated with love, fertility, 
war, and gold. After hearing this, the Aesir came together in council and agreed that while the offer was tempting, the price was too great. Then, they counter-offered with terms of their own. Instead of three and a half years, the builder would have one winter to finish the berg, and if any part of it wasn't complete by the first day of summer, the contract would be void. Also, no other man could help him out. The builder pondered this proposition for a moment and said that if he could use his horse, Fathofari, for help, he would accept. And the Edda says that, at the suggestion of Loki, this was granted him. Remember that detail because it's going to come up later. Pretty much immediately after the building process began, the Aesir noticed that Spathofari, the horse they let the builder use, was doing at least 50% more work than the builder himself. They felt like they had been deceived, or some might say, had a taste of their own medicine, and they wanted to sabotage the builder. But their agreement was made in front of witnesses and under oath because the builder knew the Aesir could not be trusted. Another reason for that oath was that Thor wasn't present when the deal was made. He was fighting trolls over in the east, and if he saw the Builder when he returned, he might just assume he's an intruder and kill him on sight. So the Builder needed a guarantee this wouldn't happen. At this point, we skip a few months into the future toward the end of winter. The Berg is standing high and strong and is only a few days away from being finished. The only thing left to add is the front gate, and the gods are shaking in their boots. Once again, they form a council to discuss the situation, and not long after the meeting commences, tempers start to flare. The Aesir are asking each other, whose bright idea was this? Why did we make a deal with some random bloke none of us know and risk plunging the heavens into darkness? Not to mention, we're going to lose Freya. That's when they realized this was all Loki's fault. He was the one who insisted the task was impossible and allowed for the Builder to use his horse. Well, after blame was found, the solution was simple. The Aesir told Loki that it was up to him to stop the wall from being built, and if he didn't, they would kill him in the most painful way possible. Cut to that evening. The Builder and Spathofari are out on the construction site doing their thing and making a concerning amount of progress on that front gate, when suddenly, a real nice looking lady horse emerges from the woods. She had already caught Spathofari's attention, but when she strutted her stuff and neighed at him, he went wild and broke out of his reins to chase after her. Funnily enough, the Builder started chasing after both of them, but it was no use. He pursued them all night without success, and now too much time had been lost for them to finish the build before the first day of summer. The Builder did his best to get the job done, but by dawn the next day, he saw his work wasn't going to be completed and said, you know what? Fuck this. And suddenly, he began to grow until he was towering over the Aesir and his face morphed from an unassuming man's to a hideous giant's. After seeing the Builder take his true form and confirm their suspicions, the Aesir considered their contract to be void, so they called up Thor and had him settle the matter once and for all. Then, as the Prozata puts it, he came straight away, swung his hammer Mjolnir, and paid the workman his wages, not with the sun and moon, but rather by preventing him from dwelling in Jotunheim. And this was easily done with the first blow of the hammer, which broke his skull into small pieces and sent him down to Niflhel. But now you might be wondering, what happened with Spathofari? Surely he was innocent in all this and didn't deserve the same punishment as his master, right? That's right. In fact, Spathofari had the happiest ending of them all. After running a long and tiring race with that beautiful mare, he got laid. And never again did he come in contact with the Aesir. But here's the thing, do you remember how the Aesir told Loki that the wall being built was his fault and it was up to him to stop it? Well, thanks to them all vowing not to get involved, Loki had to find a fix without the giants ever discovering their collusion. So, he used his magic to take the form of a beautiful young mare. Yes, it was Loki who distracted Spathofari, but I'm willing to bet that banging him was not part of the original plan, even though that's what happened. I can totally imagine Loki in his horse form realizing after 10 or so hours of being chased that he once again bit off more than he could chew, and that the only way to get Spathofari off his back would be to let him mount it. So that's what he did. Loki took a big one for the team, and about 11 months later, he returned to the Aesir. Only he wasn't alone. Trotting alongside him was a young gray foal with eight feet. It was his son, Slepnir, and he would grow up to be the best of all horses. What do you think are the odds that Disney ever incorporates that myth into the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Personally, I think a scene where Tom Hiddleston gives birth to a horse is exactly what the next phase of the MCU needs. Not to mention, Disney already kind of pulled a similar gag with a fake female horse in Hercules. But that was back in the 90s, so they're overdue for another one. Seriously though, as you'd imagine, this was not one of Loki's proudest moments. He wasn't prone to letting things get under his skin, but there were a few events in his life that he preferred not to be reminded about, and this was one 
one of them. But it wasn't the only occasion where Loki took the form of a feminine being. There is of course the myth where Thor has to marry the giant and Loki has to disguise himself as a handmaiden. And in the poem called Lokasena, where Loki roasts all of the gods that are dining in Aegir's hall, Odin shames the trickster for spending eight years on earth, quote, as a cow in milk and as a woman, and you've given birth to children. I call that a pervert's way of living. And if Odin, along with the rest of the Aesir, think less of Loki because of his time spent as a cow and a woman, just imagine what they think about him getting railed by a horse. At least Odin got a brand new fortress and the new steed out of it, right? It's funny how Sleipnir could be one of Odin's most prized possessions while simultaneously one of Loki's most shameful reminders. I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on this one now. Does knowing that Loki was impregnated by a horse and gave birth to one change the way you see him now? And and if you were Loki, how would you have tried to stop the wall from being built? Leave your answers in a comment down below. And while you're thinking those through, I'll tell you all about this week's sponsor, Squarespace. For those who haven't heard, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform anyone can use to build your online presence. Whether you're launching your own store, marketing some recipes, showing off your art, or trying to promote your business, Squarespace has you covered. Here's how it works. You go to squarespace.com slash John Solo and sign up for your free trial. You take a short quiz detailing what kind of site you're looking to launch, and some of your goals, and by the end, you have dozens of templates at your fingertips, all curated for your specific needs. Once you've chosen a template, you can customize it like I did. On MessedUpOrigins.com, I've got links to our series playlists, a list of my favorite books to use in my research, galleries full of solo fam art, and I'm only scratching the surface of what's possible. You can embed videos on your site, create VIP members-only areas to sell access to, and one of my favorite things Squarespace does is give you access to analytics that show you how much traffic you have, where it's coming from, what people are doing while they're on your site, and that info goes a long way when growing your business. Go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to try it out completely free. And when you're ready to reveal your masterpiece, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Solo fam, thank you all so much for tuning into this episode of Norse Mythology Explained. If you enjoyed it and learned yourself something, be sure to trample over those like and subscribe buttons with a horse to have more content like this delivered to your sub box every week. If you want to stay updated on news about the show, send me suggestions, or tell me your secret family recipe for the perfect pot pie, find me on social media. Handles are right there and links are down below. Gunther also wants me to tell you about the Messed Up Origins Patreon, where you can support the show, get access to behind the scenes content, and join our Discord for as little as $1. Yes, he really wanted me to tell you that. Gunther is pretty selfless, though I may have told him that Patreon money was all going toward his treats. I'll see you all again next week with the very messed up origins of Zagreus, the prince of the underworld and protagonist of the Hades game. Until then, thanks again for watching. My name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.